Warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining this Deep Adaptation Q&A. And I am joined today by Kevin Freer. Kevin is a uh, eco-socialist deputy leader of Lancaster City Council, and he's founder of Climate Emergency UK, which we will hear a little bit more about today. Kevin, you are a grandparent and you live in Lancaster co-housing. You are a community energy pioneer. You've got your master's degree in human ecology, and you also trained with Joanna Macy to lead the work that reconnects. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about you? I'm sure you'll find out as we as we talk. <clears throat> it's really, really. I'm really personally really glad that you've joined us. I'm. Um, I've been. I've known you now for a couple of years, I think. Um, and I am. Yeah, I have been constantly inspired by your integrity, your um, ability to continue to to inspire and to work really hard and bring your passion and your whole self to the work that you do while also holding this uh, the challenge of um yeah hopelessness i guess and holding these two things with with huge dignity um i wonder whether you could start by sharing a little bit about when and how you became fully awake to the se severity of the unfolding crisis and what impact that has for you yeah so it, it's been gradual it's been sporadic you know there's been times I've been more aware than others um but it started you know I grew up in a one of five uh, children in a council house in Barry in South Wales absolutely nothing in my environment from my parents that would uh, set me on this journey apart from a youth leader a catholic youth leader who um introduced me to the new internationalist magazine uh, which i'm sure will, will have had some um impact on me i did uh, i went to teach training college did physics and uh, environmental studies so that that will have helped um i then uh, so i became i tried to become vegan in 1974 um which was just unsustainable at the time. It was one brand of, of soy milk, plow milk, which was disgusting. <laughs> um, but I went vegetarian then and gradually uh, became vegan about 30, getting on 30 years ago. So I've been aware of the industrial farming system and the crazy um, idea that you you grow all this wonderful protein soya and stuff and feed it to animals and get about 10 percent return right from from the the, the the mid 70s so it's been gradual but i certainly probably 20 years ago i probably had really kind of understood the situation i didn't read um uh uh, limits to growth for example I, I did read uh rachel carson's son spring um in my teens but i didn't come across limits to growth probably until i did the human ecology masters and i chose that because being aware of how bad things are i wanted to understand how on earth we got to where we we were so i spent a year studying wonderful things like uh, eco-psychology spiritual activism um really uh, and that's that's where i mean the course was very much inspired by joanna macy so as while i was on the course i went and did 10 days with her in fintorn um so i was really by that point trying to get dive deep i guess into um what was going on and how on earth we got to where we were and and, and i guess looking for some clues as to what could be done about it um george marshall was another big inspiration behind um you know who, who's who's just uh really good at, tr at understanding the psychology of how you know and how we can he's george marshall has spent time with climate outreach um talking to tea partiers in in the states you know sort of spending time with people who are in a sense the opposition trying to understand the psychology and so on so i've been interested in the psychology the sociology all of that which really 
um, the human ecology course with um, Alistair McIntosh, who, who some of you might know about, know about who um, wrote books like Soul, Soul and Society and other books about climate change. Yeah, and, and then I, I got asked to get involved in community energy very early on, so founded Gloucestershire Community Energy Co-op and uh, got, I guess I, w I went from the course and disappointed probably um, my, you know, ha having spent so much time on the, the kind of psychology and sociology, I, I dived into practical solutions. Um, and almost in a way kind of forgetting what I learned really. Um, so I really got into community energy. Um, we built a, um, a community owned hydro here that I raised 1.3 million in community shares for. Um, moved to Lancaster Co Housing 10 years ago, which is described as, as eco homes in the village. Um, built a passive house standard and fed directly by hydro on the river. And so, so trying to live practically um, as sustainably as, as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a way, kind of focusing on, on, on practical solutions whilst knowing that that wasn't enough, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I'm I'm hearing already this uh, this pattern of holding uncomfortably the knowledge that the actions you're taking are not enough, but that not not being something that has got in the way of you, yeah, really putting your shoulder against making a change. Um, when did you get into local politics, and was was that with the Labour Party when you first got involved and yes. I want to hear about your journey with the Labour Party. Yeah, so I um, first joined the Labour Party in my 20s. I was in North Kensington, my children's home, and um, it was a very vibrant local, uh, very left-wing um, party that in a marginal seat, so there was a chance of getting somebody elected, a couple of Tony Benns, um, children were were involved so I got really fired up by local politics then and then I moved to back to South Wales where I come from uh, as a teacher and um, was really inspired by the likes of Rod Rodri Morgan who you know Wales has got a history of some really good quite radical left-wing leaders now with with Mark um, but it was Rodri and and again I so I kept I kept inspired, even though the, the, the average traditional Welsh Labour Party were, were, were dire, you know, absolutely anti-politics, anti really. Uh, but there was enough to keep me going. Um, I think I left, as I remember, when, uh, with, you know, so many of us did, uh, with Blair and the Iraq War and, and, and so on, totally disillusioned. But somewhere in between, I joined the, because I, li I lived in Birmingham for a good 20 years after South Wales, um, I joined the Ecology Party, so that tells you how long ago that was, because that's what the Green Party was uh, uh, called originally. Um, <clears throat> so I've been dabbling with green socialist politics ever since, not finding a home really, not being satisfied with, with either, until Jeremy Corbyn came along and suddenly there was this little just kind of ray of hope oh, there's a possibility that, that, that politics will actually, uh, you know, the politics I believe in actually has, has a chance to take some power. I um, know we do have some people here who aren't in the UK. Yeah, um, I don't want to assume that they know what you're talking about. I wonder if you could say a little bit about what, what Jeremy Corbyn coming to power represented to you. Yeah, so Jeremy Corbyn... Um, is is very left well he's not very left-wing actually by by uh, international standards he's often described as as you know equivalent to about a swedish social democrat but he is somebody who um who's been a labor mp a very long time always on the fringes of the labor party always standing up for what are seen as unpopular causes like uh, you know standing up for palestinians standing up for you know, for, for the poor, basically, um, never had a, 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 a sniff of, of any, um, 
you know, official position or anything. And then there was enough of uh, MPs in Parliament when, when it came to a leadership election to, um, you have to get four, you had to get 40 MPs to, to nominate you. Some of them said they did it just so there was a competition, never thinking that he would get elected. But the rules of the Labour Party at the time were that anybody could join and support him. And literally hundreds of thousands of people like me joined the Labour Party to support Jeremy Corbyn. And he actually got elected as, uh, as, as the leader. And for a, a while, um, you know, he was, he was very, um, he, he very much got climate change. He stood up for the, the poor and disenfranchised. And it was an exciting time. And it, that was a time, too, when I um, rejoined. So I rejoined the Labour Party. And then I live in a, a rural area just outside Lancaster. And, and the, the current councillor um, got ill. He was an independent. There'd never been anything other than Tory or independent here. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I'll stand for the local council, never thinking I would get elected. And... Um, I had a good relationship with the Greens because I'd been in the, uh, the Green Party uh, again uh, before joining Labour. I had a good relationship with them, but they stood a candidate, one of my neighbours, against me. So we thought we would split the uh, anti-Tory vote and let the Tory in. And in the end, I beat her by two votes. <laughs> the Tory was like 10 votes behind. So I, I became what I, I, I think is a pretty accidental um, politician or, or councillor. And immediately, my whole focus was, was climate change. Immediately, I, you know, we had a very, very right-wing uh, Labour administration that was, you know, just had half the seat, so they only just had control. And I was, I was number 31 out of 60. And I caused trouble. <laughs> I um, formed alliances with disaffected Labour people, with, with Tories, and... and proposed motions against the wishes of the um, Labour leadership and there's very tight um, whipping that goes on so you're not really allowed to do that and ended up getting the council to declare a climate emergency which although it was initially opposed by the Labour leadership we packed the meeting that there's the, the majority there, there's 400 local authorities in in the country you know similar to to most places in the world um, and the vast majority of those have now declared a climate emergency. We were one of the first and um, packed the council chamber. It was a time when, when uh, Greta Thunberg was uh, inspiring lots of young people. Um, Extinction Rebellion had started. So there were literally, the council had never seen anything like it. 200 people. They didn't know what to do with them. You know, they, 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 there wasn't room for everybody, but they, they kind of stood in the aisles. <laughs> And, and everybody in the end voted for, for the, climate, you know, the, the climate emergency motion. And that was in January. And then in the May, there were, we, we have every four years, the whole council gets re-elected. It, it varies from council to council. And Labour lost a lot of seats, um, so had to form an administration with the Greens and the Lib Dems. And I, and again... I have a habit of doing these things last minute. I was in a Labour group meeting and and suddenly, you know, the election for deputy leader of the Labour group came up and I put my hand up and said, you know, uh, oh, I'll stand and got elected. So I became the deputy leader of the council. Um, and then, you know, J Jeremy Corbyn got totally undermined by his own party. They, it, Labour is not a socialist party. It's not a part, you know, it's it's a... It's it, it, whatever its history, most of it is 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 actually quite right wing, quite um, conservative with a small C and so on. So they eventually chewed Jeremy Corbyn up and spat him out, you know, undermined him, deliberately lost the election in 2019. Although everybody blames it on Jeremy Corbyn, they actually conspired. There's lots of evidence of how they conspired to do everything to stop him and Labour winning. Um, so that was that, you know, that meant that, that we were on the way out, really. Um, but I'd been to a, whilst he was still leader, I'd been to a Labour Party conference in 2019, 
where Labour committed to a radical Green New Deal on the 2030 deadline. And it's the 2030 deadline that, for me, distinguishes people who are really serious about the, the climate crisis, even though it's still far too late, and, and 2050 deadlines and so on. So that, for me, was absolutely critical. If, if, if Labour had stuck to that, then I would have stayed even, even under new leadership. But they didn't. So a group of five of us left, became eco-socialist independents, formed alliances with the, the Greens, and the um, Greens have always been strong in Lancaster City Council, and in May last year overthrew the Labour, Labour leader, and I became deputy leader again, because I'd, I'd lost that when I left the Labour Party, to a Green leader. So Lancaster's one of the only councils in the country, the only other ones are um, Brighton and Lewis, that has, has ever had a, a Green um, leader of the council mm -hmm. so, and we're still here <laughs> despite um, try, you know labor undermining that they're, they're still they're, we have seven seven um, parties or independent groups um, so it's we have an alliance of five running the council but labor do everything they can to actually undermine us even though they're part of the administration mm. yeah there's um what I would like to do I'm going to come to this in a bit is here you talk about climate emergency uk and what motivated you to establish that but first um i'm i have been fascinated hearing you talking in the past about the the day-to-day -day lived experience that you have of in public um contexts in meetings and speaking with the public there's one narrative but how often in a one-to-one -one context, people speak to you very, very different about their, yeah. their view of the future. And yeah, yeah this, this is part of the, yeah, I feel the energy coming down to the, 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 the tender part of what I guess everybody here who, who shares a particular outlook probably feels quite often. Yeah, so um... A recent example was um, I, I went to COP26 for the whole time, not in any official capacity, but there were lots of my friends from different organizations um, there. And they're people who their public face is, you know, Friends of the Earth and technical alternative technology and things like that, working on very solutions focused and, and political, political focus. And I, I just sat down in the pub with, with one of them and immediately the conversation shifted. And this, this has happened lots of times to people saying, well, actually, I don't really have any hope that anything that we do is, is going to change things. Um, and, and that is quite, you know, I'm, I'm living somewhere where it's, you know, th these are people who are very conscious and very aware, but also very engaged in, in solutions. Um, so, it, but, but every time, it, it's almost like there's this kind of shared, unspoken knowledge of, of just how, the reality of just how hopeless things are but it isn't easy to speak about in, in public, if you like, you know. So it's like, yeah, the public face is, is one thing. And then the, the kind of one-to-one -one conversation, you really get to, um, the, yeah, how people are really feeling. And, and I guess, I, and I, you know, I just think at some level, most, most of us know, most people know just what's really going on. But, you know, that to, just to exist day to day, to carry on day to day, we just need to forget that as well. Yeah. And is that true for you? Do you feel the same challenges to, to speak openly and honestly? <sighs> I find it really hard. I, I don't do it very often. And when I do, um, I was in Bolden, for example, we had a public meeting just before uh, COP26 and the Environment Agency had just published a report that said that literally is entitled Adapt or Die. You can't be much more explicit than that. And the Environment Agency is, is a quasi-governmental body. You know, it's the establishment. It's, um, you know, it, 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 they don't 
often kind of say things like that. So, and Andy Brown, well, yeah, Andy, who um, is their local flood officer, we've had two serious floods here in the last five, six years, T you know, totally um, related to climate change, intense rainfall. Um, and, you know, he, he is the flood risk manager. He knows the, rea you know, just at the impact of, of climate change. So when I've, yeah, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that when I feel like I've got some support in the room, it's easier. When I speak out, um, I've been accused of, of being incredibly negative and, and, and it's almost like you mustn't say these things because you'll depress people and you'll demotivate people. And, you know, we're trying to officially get people more engaged and inspired and involved in, in uh, addressing climate change. And if you tell people how hopeless you're feeling things are, then they're not going to want to do anything. You're going to demotivate them. So that's the that's the difficulty I've had. I the, the another opportunity I had was I was asked by one of the two local government magazines, Municipal Journal, again before the before COP, um, asked Extinction Rebellion for their perspective on councils declaring a climate emergency. And um, that filtered down to me. Um, I have a, a, a good relationship with a lot of people in XR. And I wrote an article basically, ba you know, looking at, at what councils are doing from an XR perspective. So I was able then with that kind of framing to, to be quite kind of outspoken and, 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 and critical. So it's, it's difficult because my colleagues uh, in, in the eco-socialist independence are more or less disengaging and, and feeling like everything's hopeless. And I'm kind of still engaged in my role. And I have these conversations with my, with my fellow councillors where they're totally despairing. And it's like, well, there's no point. There's no point in doing what you're doing, really. You know, it's mm -hmm. hopeless. So, yeah, I, I live with it day to day, but find it really hard in a public arena to speak in a way that is truthful, um, but, but honest. Yeah. Truthful. Um, yeah, I, I, that was a really, really clear response. Thank you, Kevin. And I, I'd love to hear from you about what are the ways, yeah, what you've just described to me is, is a definition of a radical hope it's you are uh not cutting off feeling the feelings and also yeah not not looking away and still continuing with your passion and your integrity and yeah and so I wonder if you could share with the people here what are the ways in which you maintain enough, enough <laughs> resilience to be able to continue what you're doing. And I'm guessing it's it's an ongoing process. It's not a, oh, I've tipped that off now. Um, yeah, and it gets- Important for you. It gets harder and harder with every passing day, really, um, because every day that, that climate, carbon emissions just go up and every day the governments around the world, you know, instead of um, keeping oil in the ground, um, want to dig more of it up, Every day it gets kind of harder and, and, and what feels like more hopeless. And I have, I'm reaching a point where, where I'm, you know, I'm probably can't, I, I don't know how much longer I can carry on doing what I'm, I'm doing, to be honest. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> what, what keeps you well? What are the important yeah, parts so of your life that nourish you? A number of things keep me well. Where I live... I mean, it's extraordinarily rich in rich natural environment. I was just talking about the, um, the, the San Martins coming back and the swifts and swallows will be here shortly. Um, the, I, I've been um, monitoring salmon and trout on the, the river as part of my work with the hydro and, and the environment agency. And um, just that connection with the natural world is, is one thing. Although at the same time, you know, I'm seeing decline in salmon populations and things like that so it it's double-edged really you know it's, it's it's both nurturing and and scary um having an incredible relationship i've been uh, with, with Alison for 14 years and it's just delightful you know she's so incredibly supportive um a partner in 
crime even more you know <laughs> in, in that she she's now getting more and more engaged in in um in climate activities and so on um and um but on a, a, a more spiritual kind of level, I, I listen a lot to Eckhart Tolle and Alan Watts and, you know, basically the message that, you know, not to take myself and, and, and humanity too seriously, but to live in the moment to, you know, nothing matters, that kind of thing. Plus, plus reading stuff that, that supports, well, well you know, I'm, I'm reading, um, David Graeber's, um, what was it called again, this? Uh, the Dawn of Everything. The Dawn of Everything. And just the, the fact that there's, that all my life I've had this story fed to me about the way things should be and so on. And, and right from the early age, I've kind of questioned that. But I'm learning every day that, you know, that, that actually my truth is is shared by lots of, of people um that so that helps me i i still don't see how that truth gets out in into the kind of mainstream it's squashed at every, you know like like with jeremy corbyn it's it's absolutely stamped out <laughs> um but i guess knowing that i'm not alone knowing that that, that other people share the uh, you know in, in, in and I get inspired by other people, that helps me to um, to keep going as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's what I have heard from a lot of people um, in the Deep Adaptation Forum and in other networks, that just having a, a space and a sense of solidarity and mutual understanding and connection. I heard, I heard you describe lots of different kinds of connection. Yeah, and I, I need... I, I, I don't get enough of it. I need more, more kind of allies and collaborators. And one of the um, ways I got that, I did the, the sustainable leadership course at Cambridge University, but it was online a couple of years ago with you and, and Jen, that's how I met you. And um, we've kept, a, 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 you know, a, a group of us have kept in touch. So it's great to kind of connect every month and, and talk like this, you know, talk about our shared reality um, and I, I need more of that. I'm aware I don't get enough of that. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Gem and I are hosting that course again in person in Lancaster in June. And, and Kevin I'm is, going, you know, it's like... joining as well. <laughs> but I, I just need that, that, that kind of nourishment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I realised that there was a question I mentioned that I haven't, uh, haven't yet asked. So after... Um, I, this will be my last question and then I'm going to invite Kimberly. So if you can get ready, Kimberly. Um, Kevin, I would like you to talk about the what inspired you to establish Climate Emergency UK, yeah, so, what it's about and how you feel about it now. Yeah, thank you. So when we, I, I was inspired to, to propose the Climate Emergency Motion by Bristol City Council, who were the first. They were inspired by um, a group in Australia who, um, uh, Darwin, I think it was, but Darabin um, Council, who, who were the first in the world to do that. Um, so what was really kind of, I, I, I've always been um, an advocate, if you like, of not trying to reinvent the wheel, but of, of you know, show. So I, I set up a website because because I, I, you know, I have a history of doing that, um, climateemergency.uk and started to collect declarations so that people could, and we tried to develop a, a kind of model declaration. So people who wanted to declare, councils who wanted to declare a climate emergency could come to the site, see what others were doing, be inspired by them and, and form their own. Um, and then council started to um, develop policies. So we started to collect those. Then an organization called My Society who were about kind of digital public engagement got in touch with all the technical skills to create a searchable database of those um, of, of those declarations, and 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 so on, um, and it led to, you know, a, a majority. And we, we used to hold weekly meetings on different kind of things that council's doing, and a conference, a couple of conferences. We've had three conferences we've been involved in now, 
and just kind of inspire, yeah, trying to encourage, inspire, share best practice and, and things like that. Um, but at the same time, um, the context really of, of local government is that we're constantly getting cut uh, by the government. We're constantly getting constrained by what we're allowed to do. So a, 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 an example is that um, in 2016, developers were not supposed to build houses that were uh, going to need retrofitting, you know, that were, were not um, energy efficient. Um, the government uh, scrapped that because they said, oh, developers aren't ready. Um, and local councils, so we as a local council are trying to develop our own local legislation that mandates developers to do that. So, but we're very constrained by national legislation. And that's just true in so many ways. We, we do everything we can to encourage people to insulate their homes, but ultimately it comes down to money. And the government in Britain do not care, do, aren't, aren't bothered. So in that, that context of, of not having the money, of not having the legislation, I've become, I'm, I'm coming up against the limits all the time of, of what local authorities can do to a point now. And I, I think I was particularly inspired by the majority of the councils that set a 2030 deadline. So it's like, my God, you know, the, the majority of councils who are not radical bodies at all are seeing the urgency that they're setting this, this kind of radical target. But what's happening now is that council after council who really genuinely tried and its officers, you know, the officers in a way are even more, the staff are in, in a way even more enthusiastic than the, than the, um, the councillors, that's certainly true in Lancaster, in trying to kind of decarbonise their fleets, in trying to decarbonise their buildings and so on, are coming up limits, uh, against limits that make it, that realising that that's just not possible. You know, I was talking to an architect recently who, because uh, every house in, the, in in Britain is not supposed to be connected, new houses not supposed to be connected to the gas grid in two years' time. Th this architect I was talking to was trying to design a, 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 a development of 90 homes um, and wants to put air source heat pumps in. He says, I can't get them. You know, the supply chains aren't there. The, skill, the, the skills aren't there. So... There are all these limits that as I, and I think that's been a good thing about really deeply immersing myself in the, the practical stuff. I'm coming out of it now thinking there's just so, such limits, however um, motivated people are to, to really do, take some radical action. Without that kind of infrastructure, never mind getting into issues of, well, you know, of course, we can't just, I've always known, we can't just replace every um, fossil fuel power station with, with renewables, you know, there's not, mm -hmm. the, there's not the raw materials, there's not the time or anything. And all that's happening is that it's becoming a top up to, in, you know, using more energy. Yes. Yeah. Got to reduce. So I'm reaching a point where I'm really hitting against the limits and thinking, maybe it's time to do something else. And mm -hmm. Climate Move UK has been really successful in getting funding. You know, we've got three full-time staff and they are utterly brilliant. And we did a, a, we did a scorecard of what every council was doing. Um, and, and that was quite welcomed by activists and, and, and councils that were doing well, but um, also, you know, reacted against by people who felt that they were being unfairly criti criticised. And, and it's great. And I'm really proud of that. But I'm, I'm getting ready now to, to kind of move on, really. And to mm. If we have time at the end, I'm going to come back to you with a question around if there were none of these limits, what are the radical actions that <laughs> local councils can be saying? Because I have a sense that the limits aren't just resources part of the limits are to do with what what we're unable to imagine um, but I'm going to come back to that because I realize this isn't about a conversation between you and me I'd like to open up to um, yeah people who have joined us and have sent a question and I'm going to ask you Kimberly first of all if you'll unmute yourself and ask your question of Kevin thank you so much Katie and lovely to see you all thank you so much Kevin um, well, my question's changed about 15 times since you've been talking. 
Um, it was, um, I, I lead a community group in Hertfordshire. It's a Hertfordshire wide community group focused on local community resilience um, and adaptation and um, including deep adaptation. Uh, and I spend a lot of time speaking with councils, councillors and officers and so on across the county. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, quite depressing. <laughs> and and, and uh, um, yeah, so my question initially was going to be, what do you have any advice about the best way of getting leverage, given that they, as you've said, as you said, are all, you know, tremendously short on resources and funding and um, mired in the kind of business as usual uh, stuff. But if I may, if there's time, I'd love to come on and ask a supplementary question. But do you have any advice about that? I guess it's about finding who the allies are. So that, and they, they could be in any political party, you know, yeah. apart from the Greens, I, um, who are, you know, pretty obvious allies if you have Greens on the council. They, you know, the, the, the people who've got involved in climate, the councillors who got involved in Climate Emergency UK include Conservatives, Lib Dems, Labour people, you know, it really is not a political thing. So I guess one of the things it's finding allies, not just amongst the councillors, but amongst the, the officers as well, because the chances are they'll be even more potential allies. So there will be people there. Um, there will be other organisations, you know, it's not councils obviously are, are very limited you know they, they, one of the things they have to do if they are going to do anything is work with with other institutions and other um so again there might be allies in the health service who who really uh you know, get that um <laughs> one one of the things that I might t talk about again when you know councils are trying a lot of councils yeah. are trying to, to to ban ca cars from their city centers and they meet huge opposition and an ally there is obviously the health service who recognize the the the, the problems that air pollution cause so i guess it's about depending you know, partly depending on the issue finding who who your allies are yeah yeah no, and that and we have found them and and that's been really useful and uh thank you no that's that's useful and i um and i really wanted to kind of just back up what you were saying about people saying one thing publicly and another thing privately, you know, in, in our conversations with councillors, um, you know, we, we show them a little graphic, which is four columns and column two is business and, as usual, but greener and column three is emergency and column four is collapse aware. And, uh, you know, so many of them say, you know, when we ask them which column they're in, because that's going to drive everything, their strategy, mm -hmm their actions, their priorities. When we ask them which column they're in, you know, they say officially, column two. <laughs> um, and then when we say, yeah, but really, where are you? And they go, well, somewhere between three and four, you know, so hardly anybody's telling the truth. You know. That's a really interesting, um, I like that diagram. You must uh, share it. After yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, if, if you could put your email address in the uh, in the chat, I'd be happy to do that. It's a really nice graphic. Um, and the other thing, have Emily, I got time for the we've we've got quite a lot of questions. Okay. All right, I'll shut up. Come back Thank to you so again. much. Hi. Yeah. So Thank much, you. Emily. So I'm going to go to um, Jonas next, please. If you can unmute yourself and share your question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um, inspiring work and uh, amazing that you're still in there and doing doing a lot of work and that's really what gives my question because I'm uh, also trying to do something in politics in Sweden uh, in a very labor intensive industry intensive uh, part of Sweden and it's difficult it's not easy but I'm still doing stuff and it's still making I think it's still making a difference so I want to just want to reach out to you and so what do you how do you manage to stay in politics, how do you manage to support others to to get involved and 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 do it? Because it's a lot of work and it, and it's hard, and especially being surrounded by that kind of negative negativity that you've been describing. How do you how do you manage to put yourself in those spaces and and stay there? I mean, that's inspiring in itself. I'm just wondering how do you I do think, that? I think partly because and and one of the reasons why I'm you know even though I, I'm 
you know, I'm, I'm disillusioned at the moment, but I stay is because of, I, I feel a solidarity with all of the people who are trying. You know, there are, um, there are people who are really um, doing their best and, and particularly the office, you know, I mean, our um, climate change team have, have, have been amazing. You know, we decarbonized our leisure center, taking it completely off gas, for example. Um, they're doing amazing stuff. So part of it is just a sense of not wanting to um, let people down to, to kind of, you know, stay in solidarity with all of the people who are doing amazing things, really. That's, I guess that's what, if I felt I was a completely lone voice, then, then I would have given up a long time ago. And I know I'm not. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for that question, Jonas. And I would like to go to Hannah next. Anna, can you unmute and ask your question? Hi, um, th thanks, Kevin. Really interesting talk. Um, I just came across this on Eventbrite and um, I'm in a local authority. I'm an officer, I'm the, a landscape architect, um, but quite new to, to the public sector. Um, and um, just wanted some advice really on how to be the most effective as an officer, because um, it's obviously a bit, tricky I can't kind of be seen to be political or too pushy about things um and it's actually it's Swindon Borough Council so it's it's oh, yeah. conservative yeah, yeah. um and I was just looking them up on your website actually I, I this is the first I've heard about that that's really useful um and I'm not very senior um and I've sort of invited myself along to the um net zero meetings um and as landscape architects, I think we've got a huge amount to offer. Um, but obviously it's within the constraints of regularly being told, you know, told you might be made redundant or we've got these enormous cuts. And but there's there is quite a lot of money um for tree planting. Um but I think with Swindon it's got this huge issue to do with transport, which is a lot more intractable um and the trees are almost becoming a bit of a um green wash yeah yeah so it's just how as an officer really I, i'm just quite new to it and um yeah. i also run a run a group in my village um we're holding a retrofit fair this weekend so i'm sort of involved in climate activism as well but it's just how to do it sort of within the council yeah um i mean there are Oh, there, there, there's a, um, a forum called the Coalition for Climate Action, um, which, um, yeah, if you if you email me, I can I can send you a link. And that is a collection of um, it, it's kind of national and local government officers, so civil servants, but also there's a couple of hundred at least of local government officers. So. I guess that might be a really good forum to to kind of share that question. I mean, from a council's perspective, we always um, feel like the officers just run everything anyway, you know, and we, <laughs> we spend our time trying to kind of influence them. So, you know, that we, we always feel like that's where the power really is. Um, I guess you probably, in the, the size of Swindon, you must have a climate change team as well. So I guess you you get to know them. Yeah, yeah, I've kind of invited myself onto it, despite not being very senior. Yeah, <laughs> very, I mean, it's very hierarchical. I'm quite surprised at how hierarchical it is, and nobody really listens to you if you're below their level, which is a bit of a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, th I think you'll probably get a lot of um, good advice from the Collective Climate Action, so that's probably about not having ever been an officer, when we, we've got brilliant officers who don't have that you know we're, we're on the same page so we, we don't have that same <laughs> problem so to, yeah to... I'm not sure there are any councillors like you unfortunately they're all conservative well, they're and authority so there must be a green or two surely at least no there's there aren't any greens I've heard a rumor that one of the Labour councillors is is quite um sympathetic um I'll, I'll have a think because I, I know I, I'm, I might have come across Swindon councillors so I'll, I'll, yeah I'll... that would be great yeah. yeah thanks Kevin thank you Hannah and good luck um I'm gonna ask Charles to ask your question it was the the second question that you sent Charles please 
Oh, sure. Very good. Uh, so, uh, Katie Stewart, thank you for hosting this and for all, I imagine, the thousand and one things that it takes to put on something like this that that we don't know about. And uh, so thank you for your, your time and dedication. And uh, and Kevin, thank you so much for, for your time and, and willingness to, you know, to uh, be in solidarity with us today. Yeah, just I'm coming from Chicago, uh, Illinois in the state. So just caveat things with, with that perspective. Uh, and and my, my question is in regards to the idea of deep adaptation and collapse acceptance. Uh, and do you find that are there ways that you found languaging the gifts of that into a sociopolitical sphere where you don't necessarily ha uh, risk as much being the target of being called a doomer. And just a, a you know, quick example would be, I find sometimes languaging this in, in, in the term of mutual aid uh, is, is sometimes a way of framing it uh, so that it, 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 it sort of Trojan horses ideas of deep adaptation without ruffling, you know, the feathers of, of, of people who, who may not have gone through any stages of awareness or grief on the road to collapse acceptance. So how, what, what are the ways of bringing the gifts of collapse acceptance in, into your work, into your life? Yeah, thank you, Charles. I think that is probably uh, where my next journey is. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much I've got to, to say now. I mean, I think building community, you know, I think our um, community here at Co-Housing, um, the, the various ways in which we're building kind of solidarity and community, not specifically around um, collapse, but I mean, you know, society is collapsing in so many ways at the moment, you know, people are, are driven to, to food banks and, and reducing their energy use and so on. So I think, yeah, I guess, I guess that building that, that community solidarity anyway, um, will, will, you know, that's something that we've really focused on. We've had, um, uh, citizens assemblies and we've really tried, you know, we're, we're, we claim that we're a, a council that, that really engage with community, but that's, you know, that's a real work in progress. But I guess, yeah, build, building community resilience, I guess. But I, as I say, you know, I, that's my journey as well, I think. Thank you. And um, I would like to ask Tony, I love your question, Tony. It is quite long. Can you deliver us the essential oil version of your question, please? Thank you, Katie. Um, the oral version. So uh, parallel uh, system, um, rather than fighting the realities, can we create a parallel way of being and living from the ground up uh, to develop uh, uh, the, the capacity and the learning necessary to uh, cope and adapt to climate change and uh, rather work on a positive track, not on the negative track, rather work on not on problem solvings, but work on uh, aspirational and uh, experimental and uh, learning how to do uh, being human and being, uh, uh, together in a conscious way. How does that go? Yeah, so when we created um, our co-housing um, a dozen years or so ago, that was exactly what we were trying to do, really, was trying to create an alternative where we share, you know, we, so we don't need so much stuff where we live where we build in um, low energy use and, 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 and um, you know, organic food is a, a kind of um, a given, if you like, and, and vegetarian and vegan eating is a given. So we were trying to build this still within, you know, a, a, a um, structure that kind of made sense to people outside. So we weren't, uh, you know, kind of, the criticism often is, isn't it? You know that that I've totally rejected. We were we were trying to create an alternative way of living within the existing 
civilization, if you like. And and (laughs) somebody commented to me recently that, um, you know, their problem with um, deep adaptation, if you like, is is how how on earth do you adapt to, you know, you you can adapt, for example, my my wife's out out in um, Spain at the moment looking at at, um, how you farm in water scarcity. And, you know, in a way, if you know, if, if there's a, if, if you're going to have less water or you're going to do this or that, there, there's ways to adapt. The biggest problem we have at the moment, it seems like, is the utter unpredictability of, 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 of the situation. So we're in our second drought in two years now around here, which will have a big impact on farmers. But we'll get heavy rain. We'll get, you know, next year it might rain a lot this time. So I don't know that there are any ways to practically um you know do things differently that so then you get back to well thing you know things are collapsing um there's no there's there's not an easy way forward we just have to support each other in the best way we can i don't know you know again i'm just i'm struggling with these things as as everybody else is and be very pleased to i'm, I'm not having enough conversations about uh, and and i in spite of doing that course with Jem and, and Katie this year, I have kind of kept deep adaptation a bit at arm's length. And I recognise now that I really, really, really need to have these conversations. I'm not talking to you as somebody who knows what they're talking about. I'm somebody who's, who's kind of deep dived into the conventional solutions, if you like, realise that that's, there's no answers there, you know, answers there. That our alternative community here you know has has great value hasn't we we always thought that you know 10 years on we'd be a model for everybody to to follow and uh we've had some local successes um but ultimately you know we 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 are a bunch of privileged white people who can afford to do things a bit differently um and people who are you know i've been reading tweets today of people who are struggling with 40 plus degrees temperatures in in delhi at the moment you know i've got i i don't know what to say to them to be honest about what the solutions are or what the ways forward are thank you mm. yeah thank you kevin i i'm gonna come back now to the, the question i mentioned earlier it seems I've heard you just say you don't know what the solutions are or the way forward, the ways forward are. Um, but, but, and I wonder if you did have a magic wand, if there were no other obstacles, uh, for example, humans suddenly became very good at collaboration peacefully. Um, if there was political will, if public opinion was aligned, what radical actions could you envisage that local authorities or local communities could take that would really help prepare communities to be resilient, to reduce harm in the face of what's unfolding? Um, yeah, so one, one thing I constantly come back to and, and see in polls and things is that what makes people happy and not the, is not the, the kind of conventional lifestyle. So create you know when when councils have really taken risks and created low traffic neighborhoods and so on and stood up to the the you know the 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 very vocal minority it's been brilliant you know waltham forest an example here where they they said we're going to do this anyway and created these wonderful vibrant community spaces um i think every every council could set up um tool sharing and things you know so one one of the big problems we have is we absolutely need to reduce consumption massively and that's not going to happen government aren't going to do anything about that that you know corporations aren't going to do anything about that but at a local level we could be sharing stuff a lot more we could be eating together more we could be playing together more festivals and you know councils do quite a lot in making the places that people yeah, making the, the spaces that locally are so colorful and vibrant music art and things like that people don't feel such a strong need to fly off to you know 
warmer climes to um you know if, if the place you live is is a great place to be you don't need to yeah. go somewhere else a place a place that you don't need to take a holiday from yeah yeah i mean we we realize every time where where you know we think about going away it's like this is the sort of place that a lot of people would come to you know why would we want to go from it yeah, yeah. but it's not just the place it is the the people and the the, the yeah people are Utterly, uh, you know, I think, again, what gives me hope is people actually are amazing. You know, they're, they're, they're really not the, the, the idea of being selfish and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're incredible. And that gives me hope. But it also has got to be something that councils can build up, you know, and, and, and encourage. And they're not very good at that, I have to say. Um, but they're, they're starting to talk much more to people and understand what, um, people want through community through citizens assemblies and things like that and that's one of the pieces of work as part of the climate emergency declarations that, that has been uh, inspiring yeah what I love about what your answer was then was this um, kind of circular logic when people talk about what kind of world really they would love to create given that the future we thought we were going to have is we're probably not going to have they end up describing the kind of world we would want anyway. Yes. You know, I used to work in education and um, you know, part of this thought experiment, people would say, oh, we'd have intergenerational learning. We'd have older people learning, you know, sharing history or sharing skills with children. Like, oh, hang on, that would be beautiful <laughs> education anyway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've been so, I don't know, brainwashed from a very early age to to um that there's only one way of doing things when actually everybody or most people deep down want as you say what what uh, what would be a wonderful world <laughs> and you did yeah. it yeah. yeah yeah and the kinds of things like loving fiercely like mutual aid and taking care they become radical political acts Yeah. Mm. So I would like to say uh, a huge thanks, Kevin, for joining us and sharing so generously. Big thanks to all of you who uh, who have take, yeah, chosen to come here to use an hour of your precious time to join us. Um, and especially those of you who have, who have uh, sent questions in, I'd like to really apologize to anyone who sent a question and that we didn't have time to ask it. Um, I'm going to ask Kimberly if she's willing to share the framework that she mentioned and I'll send it on a follow-up email to all of you who came, um, then you'll have it. And this, the recording of this Q&A will be shared on uh, Gem's YouTube channel in a few days time. I'll share that link for you. And that is all. I look forward to seeing you for the next Deep Adaptation question and answer. And Kevin, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you.